everyone, Rich Redman here, and this is Pick Rich's Brain, Episode 3. Drummer, percussionist, author, composer, songwriter, producer, professional speaker, actor, Rich Redman has left his mark on thousands of songs, including over 21 number one hits, over 30 years of been there, done that, wisdom and knowledge in the Nashville music business. This is Pick Rich's Brain. We're here in beautiful Nashville, Tennessee. Crash Studio behind the board is my good buddy Jim McCarthy, longtime friend Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com. He's got four cameras here. He's, 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 he's manning the boards. He's doing it all. Um, yeah, what's going on? You know, fun day. Uh, fun day in Nashville because talk about speaking about the power of relationships. A friend that I made 14, 15 years ago named Kelly Sutton. She is kind of like the Ryan Seacrest of Nashville. She is an internet, radio, and television host, and she hosts the morning show at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time on WSMV Channel 4 here in Nashville called Today in Nashville. And so I got a call yesterday saying, Rich, Carol Sullivan, her co-host, um, was on a family vacation. And she said, would you like to come in and, and, and co-host the morning show as a guest host? And it was fun. I got to wear my jacket. I was all mic'd up. I had the little sports talk radio in-ear monitor, like Hitman, you know, bodyguard thing. And uh, it was good. You know, we read copy. We got to taste some barbecue. I knew all the musical guests that were on. It was really fun. It was actually like wearing an old pair of shoes. And I learned a little bit about reading copy. And I was very impressed with myself because I have bad eyesight. I'm over 40, guys. And this just happened. Happens. You know, you, you hit 40 and it's like, I went out and bought myself some really stylish readers and I said, I'm going to need that teleprompter. I need the type to be huge. Well, it turns out it was fine. I was able to read uh, read the giant letters. So it was, uh, it, it worked out really, really good. Um, it was fun. And uh, yeah, just one of those things, another little feather in the cap, working um, towards these new goals that I've been setting for myself, you know, because if you are not changing you're not growing. And so we have to constantly be growing in life. Otherwise, we're that fruit that ripens. And you know what happens to ripened, ripened fruit? It spoils. It rots. So we have to stay fresh. We got to stay green like an avocado. Put avocado on everything. Put it on your cereal. It'll live forever. When you're green, you grow. When you're ripe, you rot. Oh, that, I thought I was looking for a rhyme there, Jim. <laughs> That's something I wanted to learn. All right. So we've got uh, the Sticks of March. Okay, Jim is keeping me on track with the Sticks of March. For you guys and gals that have been tuning in, Sticks of March. These are my Rich Redmond Active Grip 595 Signature Drumsticks from Promark. They've been out for about a year, year and a half. There's been some great feedback. What's great about this stick? It feels good. It's all about the feel. It feels good in people's hands. The feedback has been really, really fantastic. It's also it's cool. My two favorite colors, black and red. There's this really aggressive uh, taper here that kind of just, we kind of wait for last second so you can kind of like spread the butter on the hi-hats. People really like the tip. It's really good for like playing all styles of music. And it feels good for you hard hitters as well. It lasts forever and it's got a proprietary finish on this this right here called active grip so when your body temperature rises you're playing those sweaty outdoor gigs you know uh, the the finish gets tacky okay much like me after an Irish coffee that's a, a joke I will always tell and there we are boom okay so uh, who's gonna win these is it a uh, what do we decide Jim well we're doing the giveaway with the drumming in a modern world uh, chapters download for $99 till the end of the month yep you get a free pair of sticks that go along with your purchase uh, so go to drummingintheModernWorld.com forward slash products. You'll find the chapters uh, download there. That's it right there. Drumming in the Modern World. DrummingintheModernWorld.com. You go to drummingintheModernWorld.com and there is nine chapters that is like usually $129. And for the entire month of March, um, which we're running out of, uh, you can get it for $99. Bucks. And I throw in a brand new pair of my signature drumsticks. It's a win. Absolutely. Hashtag winning all the way. If you want to brick of Rich's drumsticks. There's 12 pairs. Yep. That's, uh, that's, that's your last, I mean, a lot of hobbyist drummers, probably about six to eight months, I would think. Uh, but a brick of sticks, just by going to your YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Rich Redmond, uh, liking, subscribing, not liking, subscribing and sharing. We're trying to get you up to uh, probably about 5,000. Yeah, I wonder where we are right now. We should check, but we were at, oh, at 4,600. Yeah. Okay, so why do I want you to go to my YouTube channel? Well, for the last decade, if not 12 
12 years or maybe longer, I was an early adapter of YouTube and I've used it to just put information that you can use to have a better quality life. And for a drummer, there's licks, there's tricks, there's performances. I put up GoPros by behind my head so you can sit in that seat of mine and see what it's like to play for 80,000 people. And there's confetti cannons going off and there's smoke and the bass player's coming up and he's winking at me and there's fire and that energy. Um, there's also live performances, rehearsals, recording sessions, and then gems of wisdom and tidbits uh, that I put on there for 10, 12 years. And then recently, I have some short comedic films if you're into comedy. Um, I've got some oh, something for the whole family on there. Uh, YouTube.com forward slash Rich Redmond. And so do that very thing and you will have a chance to win an entire brick of my signature sticks. Right on. Well, getting yeah. into it, we got I, the first question that pops up, and I know we got a bunch here that we looked over for throughout the week, but this is actually a pretty good question and it's actually it deals with a lot of practicality. Um, Zach Lindley, um, he says, advice for songwriters not in Nashville, move there or give up? Wow, it's heavy. <laughs> All right, Zach. Um, great question, and thanks for sending this stuff in, because as you can see, people have been reaching out to me for the last you know, 12 years, and they're not always drummers. They're people that want to get in the music business. They are in the music business, but they want to up their game, um, and they're all very valid questions. I would say that if you want to take something to the next level and be on the level with your colleagues, you want to be colleagues with these hit songwriters, you've got to be where the action is. You have to jump in the deep end of the pool. You have to swim with the sharks. There's blood in the water. You have to compete. And the only way you're going to compete is by being here. Nashville is the songwriting capital of the world. What happens? in Nashville. There's a song being written right now. There's a song being recorded right now. Some are hits, some are not. But the song, it's everything is about the song in Nashville. And we all benefit. As a recording and touring drummer, a singer, a songwriter, an artist, a producer, they are all gonna need my services to bring those songs to life. So yes, if you are a song, it depends on what your, your goals are, what your, what your definition of success is, Zach. If you wanna just write songs and eventually put out a 10 song record that your whole family and friends will enjoy, that's one thing. And then actually wanting to get a record deal or have your songs recorded by the Blake Sheldons or the Jason Aldeans, there's only one place you can live and that is right here. Right on. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So the first question we had throughout the week that was sent to you, I believe, by uh, Lisa Teller. She oh, yeah, Lisa Telfer. Telfer. Yeah, she's been to a lot of my camps. Oh, very cool. Yeah, she's cool. Do you recommend when learning covers to chart everything out? Mm. I know Lisa, and I apologize for those listeners out there that just on the audio, I am drinking a chocolate almond protein shake from Smoothie King. Brought to you by Smoothie King. Brought to you by Smoothie King. That's so right. yeah, Lisa, great to hear from you. Um, she was at my Nashville Drummers Camp last year. She played a cool shuffle at Douglas Corner Cafe, which I was at last night. Um, charting everything out, yes. Because it's a cool skill set to be able to chart everything out. Every note you hear, every crash cymbal, every hi-hat opening, when you go to the bell of the ride, orchestrating all the tom hits and everything, that's a great skill set to have. And there's a lot of session drummers out there in the world, um, the Kenny Aronoffs, the Mark Schulmans, that we have the ability to write things out, and that really helps. Um, say if we're replacing a drum machine and the, the producer wants everything kind of note for note, but with a human feel, that's, a, that's where that kind of skill set really comes in handy. Um, eventually, you'll be responsible, if you start working at my pace, you'll be responsible for so much material that sometimes you'll, I have sort of a hybrid charting system. That hybrid charting system is based on less is more information. Just I write out phrases, I write out the beat, I write out specific fills that people might be, uh, might be uh, emotional about or attached to, and it gets me through the song. I know the tempo, I know how it starts, I know how it ends, I know the attitude, I know the basic figures, and I know all the information I need to get through that track. Um, both of these charting systems are based on you understanding rhythms and rhythmic notation and classical notation. So a lot of people want to skip. They want to go to that next step and they go like, well, how can I make these cheat charts that you make? But they can't read any of the rhythms from the Ted Reed book. If you're a drummer out there or a musician, a musician that plays any instrument, you should be able to read the rhythms in Ted Reed's 
book. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tome, man. It's the Bible of the drumming world. It's by Ted Reed. It's called Syncopation for the Modern Drummer. And one of my goals on my to-do list is to reimagine the Ted Reed book. And I'm going to basically rewrite that book. And I'm going to rewrite it so you can apply these rhythmic constructs to rock, funk, pop, country, uh, bluegrass, <laughs> everything classical music. So, but you've got to be able to understand what rhythms are and what they look like on paper. So I can listen to the radio. I can hear a rhythm. I can immediately write it down. I could also look at a piece of paper, read that rhythm and know what it will sound like. And that's a skill set. Now you don't have to go to an expensive teacher like me to learn that rhythm, to learn that skill set. In your small hometown, you could probably go to a teacher for an affordable price, can walk you through the Ted Reed book. But the Ted Reed book is a great start. So then you can start fully transcribing, and then eventually, as you get sassy with the skill set, you can start doing these hybrid um, shorthand. Right on. Yeah. Well, Aaron Martin, he actually chimed in, I guess, during the week, but he also commented with the same question here. Good question. Uh, do you think it's more relevant nowadays to teach students how to read slash write number charts instead of actual sheet music? No, great. These are great questions about charting. Now, I know Aaron because I think I met Aaron at the uh, Roland booth. I met him at the Roland booth at one of the percussive art societies, and he's a guitar player, which is really good. So to have a guitar player kind of following me is really good. And his band, he's playing with a band, and they recorded... Texas Was You, this Jason Aldean song, and they did a really good job on it, and he sent me the MP3 of it. Really great job, bud. Um, I will say this. Number charts are very specific to Nashville. It's um, a very efficient way of doing things. It's how we do things so quickly in Nashville. But anywhere you go in the world outside of Nashville, you're going to be reading chord charts. You're going to be reading transcriptions. You're going to be reading traditional classical notation. And now we're talking Broadway plays. We're talking, um, we're talking theater. We're talking cruise ships. Uh, you need to understand how to read classical notation. Uh, to take it one step further, I would say learn it all. Learn how to read a lead sheet. Learn how to read a chord chart. Learn how to read a through composed classical notation piece. And that means not tablature for you guitar players. Um, we're talking notes on the scale. We're talking, you know, five lines, four spaces. And then also learn the Nashville number system. Now, you, Jim, my buddy Jim Riley has a great book on the Nashville number system where you can actually follow along with original compositions that he's created. And you can remove your particular instrument, drums, bass, guitar, piano, and play along with the arrangements and watch the numbers go by. And that's pretty much what we do in Nashville is we watch the numbers go by. The Nashville number system outlines the harmonic structure of a song, one, four, five. That means this in key, the key of C major, the C chord, the F chord, and the G chord. That's one, four, five, okay? So you need to learn how to do all these things. And that comes from two things, a desire to learn these skill sets and, um, a desire to do these things and then experience in the trenches, okay? Um, I learned the Nashville number system by being booked on a recording session and I walked in and I said, what is this? And the keyboard player pulled me aside and said, hey kid, it works like this. Every time you see a number, it's four beats. So just count and watch the stuff go by, dig. And I was off to the races, you know, and now now I'm a master of it. You know, you can, you can hand me a piece of paper and I can interpret it. Right on. Yeah. Matt, no last name. Uh, he says, what's your thought process before you come in with your drum parts, before you get into the studio, and does it change throughout the recording process? Also, is it hard to be innovative? Wow, okay, yeah. Was that Matt? Matt. Yeah, Matt didn't send his last name, but thank you so much for sending your emails, guys. And if you do have questions throughout the week, use the hashtag on all the socials, pick Rich's brain, no apostrophe on Rich's, hashtag pitch Rich's brain, and we'll be able to locate you and answer your questions on forthcoming shows. Okay, so is it hard to be innovative? Yes, because we're in Nashville. I think all music has, a, there's a language, okay, for any idiom, whether you're playing jazz or folk or pop or rock, there's a musical language that comes from playing that particular genre. And in Nashville, the songs start with usually someone strumming a guitar. And the strum pattern, jing, 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 so it's falling in a tempo that's usually somewhere between 69 and 88 BPM. So a lot of hit songs are written between those 
those tempos. So if you have a metronome, go put on 69 and put on 88, okay? And a lot of hit songs are in there. Like I know the Jason Aldean, we have a lot of hits at 70, 71, 74, 86, okay? There's a lot of those magic numbers. And there's a, uh, somebody told me there's there could be a science to what key you record a song in or the particular BPM or the feel and all that kind of stuff. So you're thinking if I have to work within that particular tempo range, there's only so many beats I could play. And there's only so many fills that I can use to set up figures. And, like it's a lot of spock boom, spock a dooms, right? You know, so if you're a drummer and you don't know about spock boom, baba booms, that's your Pat Boone, Debbie Boone. And there's there were people that were the masters of this. These were the drummers with Stax records, the drummer with Motown records, early classic rock records. Recordings. Nigel Olson. Who's Nigel Olson? He's the drummer with Elton John. You got to do the research. You got to know your drummers. So, so yeah. So I pull my hair out trying to be innovative, but at the same time, it's about the song. Somebody wants to laugh. They want to cry. They want to be told a story. So the drums stay out of the way. And a great friend of mine. He's been in Nashville, I think, two years. His name is Zoltan, okay? You'll never forget Zoltan's name. I met him at the Musicians Institute, and instead of moving to Los Angeles or New York, he decided, like everybody, to come to Nashville, Tennessee. He's making a great go of it. He's playing all the time. He texts me, and he goes, Hey, Rich, the fill coming into the second verse of Any Old Barstool, which is our, our new Jason Aldean single, which is on the radio, which I think is about to go number one. He goes, Dude, super creative. I'm like, wow, that's a cool compliment because it's like a press roll. So there's a loop going. It's like. With the, you know, so it's basically the influence of like a press roll, which I learned, you know, when I was seven years old, learning how to play the drums. And then I combined that with a flat flam and then subdivided the, the missing beats in between the kick drum. And then I added my Sandy Gennaro bop, boom, da, boom, with the upbeat on the hi hat thing. And Sandy stole it from a drummer, which stole it from a drummer, which stole it from a drummer. And we all just keep stealing from each other. Um, so we try to be creative and create a Mona Lisa, but also we work within this construct because we want to get these songs on the radio. If it gets too crazy or too avant-garde, it will never see the light of day because you got to remember your audience is soccer mom. She's in her minivan. She's dropping her kids off. She wants to be told a story and she doesn't want to hear a drum solo. Okay, so that's how I pay my mortgage, trying to come up with cool ways of going, all right? So you got to think about those things. And, uh, and, and in the studio, the drum part is liquid, yes. Sometimes we'll hear a, a demo recording, which is like a demonstration. It could be a, a guy on his laptop programming everything with a real singer, or it could be a full-blown eight-piece band that kind of demos the song. So we get a copy of the demo, we get a copy of the charts, and then I do what I call redmanizing. So redmanizing is figuring out a way to tip my hat to everything that the producer, artist, songwriter, and band sees musically fit, but at the same time, leaving my little mark. Something that people can go, oh, I think that's rich. It's totally possible to be a, to, to be a master, to please everybody. I, I try all the time. I really do. And so, uh, you yeah. know. That's what you got to do, though. You do. You have to figure out a way to make everyone happy and make sure that they're happy first. And along the way, be able to leave just a little bit of magic fairy dust. <laughs> that was Matthew, uh, Matt Micklewain, by the way. He actually chimed in and said, uh, uh, they said, that was actually my question. Dude, great job, Matt. Thank you for tuning in, man, and keep those questions coming. Right on. Uh, from Brad Lord, <clears throat> this is kind of along the lines of drumming in the modern world. Mm. My goal is to move to Nashville or another music hub by 2020. What can I be doing in the meantime to cut my teeth here in Salt Lake City to be ready for the big C when I swim over there? Nice. This is eloquent. He's eloquent, dude. You sure you want to be a drummer, man? You write poetry. Um, yeah, Salt Lake, man. That's uh, what's this cool drum shop there that I've never been able to do a clinic at. But <laughs> so it's really good. Well, we're usually there on a Thursday or a Friday or a Sunday. Hint, hint. Hint, hint. Um, but yeah, 2020, man. Okay, so good. You got your sights set on that. I don't know how old you are. Something tells me you might be finishing college, and then you're moving here. You're 22, 23, 24 years old. Fantastic. I try to save a little bit of money. I didn't save any money when I moved here, and I was a little desperate, and I had to work a lot of day jobs. Um, so maybe save a little bit of money. The things you need to know. Well, 
you can just move here and be a master of country music. Know about the history of country music. Know about everything that's happening on the radio right now. Know all the artists. Know who their drummers are. Play along with the stuff. Transcribe it. And you will have a leg up. I will tell you that. But it's also really good to have a really deep well. Like have your the information that you have that you can tackle anything musically be very very deep so this lesson like here's a lesson here's a life lesson tomorrow I'm flying to Charlotte okay and I'm going to be playing is it Charlotte North Carolina or Charlotte where's Charlotte North South Carolina? Carolina? Okay, Carolina. I'm playing the South Carolina. Where am I? I'm going to Charleston. I always get those two cities. I'm going to, yeah, ooh, Jim says, fix your hair. Um, I'm going to uh, Charleston, South Carolina to be a guest artist for the South Carolina Day of Percussion. So I'm doing a talk on the music business. I'm doing a master class and inviting kids to play up, come up and play styles. And I'm going to put them through their paces. They've got to play Motown. They've got to play a shuffle. They've got to play a, uh, they've got to play a Texas shuffle. They've got to play a train beat. They're going to do a Mozambique a part of partido alto a bossa nova a samba a calypso a reggae they're going to do all that stuff and if you're looking at me like this like what is that mildred you've got work to do okay so these are styles so i'm gonna have the kids come up and play these styles then i'm going to do my crash course for success where i'm going to play along to hit songs and talk about how i came up with the drum parts of these these hit songs and I'm also going to be playing with a hundred-piece steel drum orchestra. Okay, so that's calypso music. That's soca music. That's music from out of our country. And I can speak those musical languages. So the more knowledge you have about music and playing styles and actually operating within those given styles is going to give you a leg up. And there's other skill sets that are playing out in these days. But however you can set yourself apart. Maybe you're an amazing background vocalist, right? Maybe you're really good at being a band leader and writing out number charts. Maybe you're you're a master of the program Ableton Live. Okay, the expectation nowadays is that you come swinging into town with a fully loaded MacBook Pro and with all the software on it and know how to do tracks, right? So that's kind of an expectation, and I myself would have to, to brush up on that. Um, but whatever you can do to kind of give yourself a leg up. So that means play, 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 play music. And uh, yes, I think drumming in the modern world is gonna help you, why? Because the six and a half hours of material that I recorded is a true reflection of what has been happening in Nashville for the last 15 years. So when you hear me play a metal song or a pop country song or a straight up traditional country song or an alt country song or a uh, Calypso inspired thing or a hard rock thing, that's stuff that I recorded right here with artists that live in Nashville. So you're, I'm actually recorded it at an iconic studio here in Nashville. So you're actually gonna be kind of soaking up the juju of what we actually do on a daily basis here in Nashville. So I say play, 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 study, study, study. Yes, by the drumming in the modern world. Check it out. You downloaded it, you bought it. Take the ride. All right, we got a little bit of a gear question from Tom Reichart, or Reichart, sorry if I'm butchering your last name. Rich, dig in the podcast and love the social media footprint you're continuing to build. Have to miss tonight's Facebook Live, but here's my question. What do you like to have in your monitor mix? I realize it's personal preference, but something I'm always curious about. Thanks so much, Tom, and very, very sweet. Guys, thank you so much for your, uh, your questions here. Um, that's a common question. What is in my in-ear monitors? Well, everything. Everything is in there because I want to be a musical drummer. I want to be able to shape phrases and interact with the interact with the musicians. At the same time, I want to be inspired. I want to hear my instrument. I want to uh, hear my drums coming back at me. And then there's a big responsibility I have with playing with a click track and playing with loops. Okay, so certain things have to be hotter. One of the hottest things in my mix. I'm sorry, I'm burping right onto my lav mic right here. <laughs> is that vocal? That vocal is everything. Everything you need to know is in that vocal because you, that's the person that's cutting your check. That's the person you have to make happy. They have to be happy, comfortable with your feel, your tempos, how you're setting things up, your energy, your consistency, everything. The band also needs that. So, so I've got a lot of kick and a lot of snare, and I tell our monitor in, uh, engineer. I say, hey, Evan, make that thing sound like a Prince record. Boo whack, boo whack, boo whack, right? And I kind of mix myself. I mix myself. A good drummer knows how to create a balance between their limbs, right? So I can hear everything in the in the in the drums. Not as many crashes and, and high overhead stuff because I, I'm already like going deaf, right? And so I've got a lot of low end thumps. So when I go boom, I hear our bass player. I've got the two guitar players. They're kind of panned a little bit off like this. 
boom and boom. I got the little bit of the steel guitar in there, just a little bit of the background vocals because they're not the, they don't really help my cause because I don't sing background vocals and a lot of Jason Aldean and then I have click and I have loops. Now the loop is usually screaming hot because I have to be super tight with the loop and everybody in the band is all jumped up on adrenaline. There's all those people out there which makes you excited. So you just kind of have to figure out from experience and time in the trenches what things you need in your in-ear monitors to be the most successful successful and confident at your job as a drummer, which means to not only lead and inspire, but also follow and interact and be musical. And that you'll learn from experience what you need to get you in your ears. Right on. Here we're, so this is kind of getting to the, the uh, segments of life that I like. Business and motivation from Paul Santo. He's got a bunch of questions here. Dude, Paul, let me just tell the listeners about Paul. Paul, Paul works, Paul is a rock star in our industry and he works with a band called Aerosmith mm -hmm. and I met him at the Boston Strong concert when Boston had the uh, that th the, the, the explosion in the, yeah the yeah so we went and it was like us and James Taylor and Carol King and a band a little band called Aerosmith so I met him there and we kind of kept in touch and Paul is very interested in all of his years of experience now and being a speaker mm -hmm. and so he reached out to me and he said how did this get started? What do I do next? How do I build this brand? And so we've been kind of talking about that. But what are his questions? He says, do you do all your own design slash art or sub out? And for that matter, did you conceptualize your business arms? Like more than the <laughs> hazy, <laughs> fast concept of mine I'm working on clarifying. Oh, he's going to get it though, Paul. Paul, we had a nice uh, two-hour conversation the other day. But, but, you know, I surround myself with experts. Jim is an expert at what he does and so I surround like with birds of a feather and I just kind of farm things out like if I'm not good at something I am gladly gonna pay somebody for their time and talent to do something better because you definitely want to be in control of your media everything your imaging what you wear how your hair is worn the drums that you play where you go what you do how you arrive everything you want to be in control of everything that you're doing and hold it to the highest standards so if somebody is better at something than me which is a lot of people in a lot of areas, I I hire them to do those things. And yes, I fully conceptualized all of my businesses. A lot of them have blossomed and grown from just being open to change and evolution, but I still feel like everything that I do in my life is connected to drumming and music, and that's why the focus of this podcast and webisode is on music, motivation, and success, because music was the start, and we need to constantly be motivating ourselves in whatever way we see fit to stay moving forward, and of course, moving closer and closer towards our definition of success. So yeah, full conceptualization of how I wanted to be the drummer I wanted to be and then from that became a recording drummer and became a teacher and then developed a platform for my drum camps and then after that came the authoring and and we're now we're into even crazier waters with hosting and acting and all that kind of stuff so another question he asked is about is uh, and this is something that we kind of touched upon earlier was about uh, inspiration, motivation, and uh, gratitude. Uh, one of the things that has always impressed me is your relentless work ethic. Could you share with your audience your thoughts on staying healthy, both mentally and physically, while on the road, and did they day also? That's from Simon Dasgupta, my friend Simon. Simon is probably, hopefully, going to be watching, and I should have had my big bottle of hand sanitizer. We have this running joke, because Simon is a germaphobe, and he always has this giant bottle of, of hand sanitizer. I'm going to buy him a jug I think for Christmas um, but Simon is a is a is a big believer we're pals he's hosted me for four or five events at a studio called Studio West in this horrific city in America called San Diego the weather is amazing um, and I love that town Simon I hope you're doing great thank you so much for the compliment um, yeah just moving forward man moving forward with all things in life so you're constantly evolving and constantly improving and as far as like taking care of yourself. I am not perfect by any means, but as you can see right here, I have a um, 
pretty much a vegan based kind of uh, protein meal in a liquid form right here because I'm on the go. We definitely have to kind of think about what we're putting in our bodies. And I fight all the time because I'm a foodie too. Like I want to I want to hit the food truck in Los Angeles. I want to go to Austin, Texas and, and eat the angry egg roll from the food truck or I want to get that, you know, that that uh, carne asada, you know, and and so I fight that. I'm Italian. I'm going to go visit my mom for three days and she's going to be like, hey, have some of this new. I got this new recipe and I made this fresh orange bread for you. I'm like, mom, oh, have another glass of wine. So I got to run around the block like 10 times. So it's a constant struggle, but things like being hydrated all the time, take a super powerful multivitamin, okay? Um, some people are big believers in supplements. I say, hey, if you have a little bit of, you can afford to put that in your budget, take the supplements. I will say this though, the FDA does not monitor this stuff. So if you're reading a, a supplement and it says, we do not promise it's going to do these things, but it may do these things. Results may vary. Go ahead and try. Experiment with this stuff. But I do know from, know from someone that travels all the time, try to get as much green things in your body as humanly possible. Drink the water. Take the multivitamin. Um, I always have protein bars, and I'm always experimenting. You know, I, li I love the Quest bars. I love the Think Thin bars. Um, thank God for Southwest Airlines. They have peanuts. You can load up on the peanuts. Uh, what else? Um, exercise. You know, exercise. Find things that inspire you, mot motivate you. Um, in my 20s, I ran and I ran and I ran, and then I st then I st um, discovered uh, weightlifting, and then it became more of like cross training, mixing things. I was a stair stepper guy for a while, and then I discovered bear. Barry's Boot Camp, and I love Barry's Boot Camp. Now I'm doing Orange Theory, and then on the road we do fun things like we run the steps of the arena or the stadium, and uh, someone will get me to a, to a gym on the road. So you know, finding things that work for you, you stay motivated and stay on track. And people are like, you don't need to work out, do you? Because you're, it's a workout up there. It's like, no, I have to work out so I can, I can do that particular thing. Because when it's a summer night in St. Louis and it's 110 degrees out with 100% humidity and there's fire on stage and you have to play like I play for 90 minutes. It's like setting up your drum set in a hot yoga studio for 90 minutes and they say, go. And I am not gonna mail it in. So there's a certain level of physical fitness that has to come from that. I will say this, when I go up to the street and I, I do Orange Theory, I always have the, uh, the highest heart rate and I never burn less than 1,000 calories. So if you're gonna spend the money to do these boutique workouts, Burn the calories, you know, get the most out of it you can. And 98% of it, unfortunately, is diet. So what's gonna happen after this? If I can get through the night without raining on a uh, glass of red wine, I'm winning. But most likely, Jim and I will have a glass of red wine, which means I'll just go and work out harder tomorrow. But it's antioxidant, it's good for you. It's red wine is great for your heart. It's just the five glasses of red wine. There, there has to be balance in your life, but, you have to be doing something to move every day and stretch. The older you get, you really learn how to stretch. I treat myself at least once a month to a massage and um, there's other ways you can spoil yourself and that's not even thinking about the mind. You know, my problem is probably don't get enough sleep and the hamster and the gerbil are turning on the treadmill in my mind constantly. So shutting things off and slowing things down are very difficult for me. So so probably some sort of motivation, if I can ever get into transcendental, mo mo uh, you know, I wanna do that. Yeah. I, I really would love to figure that. Yeah, because that's really good for attracting the things you want to attract into your life because you're supposed to be closer and closer to the infinite power of the universe. Now we're getting super, super metaphysical, but just think about a lot of water, stretching, exercise, multivitamin. You know what? Uh, Tony Robbins actually has a really good morning routine he does called priming. And y'all you should, you should look it up and, and uh, blow him up to get him as a guest on Rick Pick Rich's I would room. I would love to have Tony Robbins here. I'd love to have Gary Vee here. I'd love to have Grant Cardone here. And this will happen. Mark my word. We will make this happen. And in the meantime, we're going to start having some other great guests on here. Absolutely. Because how many business owners, speakers, authors, actors, musicians, producers, songwriters do we know? Mm -hmm. Lots. I know like like five. You know like five thousand. No, but through me, you know a lot. I know. I know. So uh, I know one thing that kind of came up with me is that a common mistake a, a musician the coming to town for the first uh, six months to a year, the mentality of it, getting up every day and having that focus. What's the what's the biggest commonality you see that they shouldn't be doing? Is it surrounding themselves with the wrong people, things of that nature? Mm. What, what do you? What do you, what is your take? Do you see that happening a lot? Well, you know, you are the, 
you are who you surround yourself with. You really are. You know, you're like the, what's the thing about the income? You, your, your income is the result of the three people you hang around with. Um, what is that, Jim? It's, uh, you are, you mirror the, uh, those who you are in constant contact. Like the five people you surround yourself with most, you will eventually be like them. Mm -hmm. So pick, choose wisely. Yeah, so birds of a feather flock together. So what are you actually trying to accomplish? Who is the person that you want to be? Surround yourself with those kind of people and reach out to those people. Don't be afraid to ask questions. I'm constantly asking for help in everything that I want to accomplish in life. I ask for the help. And Jim does the same thing, you know? Um, successful people ask for help. What's someone going to say? No. Mm -hmm. If you want to ask out that sexy girl at Starbucks, just do it. The worst thing she can say is no. It's a sale, baby. It's a, life is a sales. Sale. Yeah. Um, but I mean, the uh, what is a, a practice you get into? Because undoubtedly everyone is human. You're going to get into, you're going to wake up one morning and all of a sudden it's just going to be, um, hold on, Matt. There we go. Oh, the Mevo is... Uh, <clears throat> you're going to be... Uh, upset about something or just, you know, so we're all going to have those mornings. Yeah. How do you snap out of it? What's your process? Well, I've always snapped out of it because I get to play the drums. So if you're actually in pursuit of, of what you really are, want to do in your life, your purpose in life, you'll be back on track right away. No, no matter what was going wrong in my life, I know that I can get on a set of tubs and change people's lives. As a result of doing this, it makes me happy as well. So finding your ultimate purpose is so important and the sooner you can do it, the better. And if you wanna start that business, start that business. If you wanna ask that girl out, ask that girl out. Just do it, just do it. Now, I see songwriters here, some hit songwriters. Maybe they start at 10 a.m., 11 a.m. They've written a song by three and they're at the bar. Mm -hmm. They're at the bar starting their night at 3 p.m. And so you just kind of kind of look, you know, things can start to be kind of habitual. So kind of look at yourself and see how you're spending your time and ask yourself if you're working in, in a positive way, if you're milking the most that you possibly can out of your day. And hey, I've been known to want to go celebrate and say, hey, happy hour is starting at 4.30 today. Because maybe there's a life thing that you just need to celebrate, but just kind of take a look at how you're spending your time, if you're spending it wisely, so working towards your ultimate goals. And we have to have goals, and they could be a life goal, a 10-year plan, a five-year plan, a one-year plan, a six-month plan, a month plan, a week plan, what you want to do today. I live and die by to-do lists. They, they stress me out, but if I didn't have that list that I could look at every day and go, oh my God, I didn't do that, 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 that. I'm going to have to get up an hour earlier tomorrow. I live and die by my to-do list. I think the most successful people do. We don't have the luxury of having a secretary. We're doing it all of our, all ourselves. I'm my own um, business development person, my own personal trainer, my own you know, business manager, my own cartage guy, my own everything. Now, this is uh, from another question that somebody asked. Somebody was asking what your thoughts were on uh, guys like Lang, Mangini, uh, uh, Portnoy, and things of that oh my nature. my God. Amazing. Um, amazing drummers. Um, one of the things that, and this is the reason why I was saying. Lang taught at my camp. The kids yeah. loved him. They ate him up. They were like, oh, my God, more. Absolutely. But, I mean, again, that comes around to marinating yourself into people. What do you, I guess that comes down to goals. What do you want to be? What kind of a drummer do you want to be? Mm -hmm. And somebody had asked what your thoughts were on those guys. Yeah. If you want to be that kind of drummer, it's very simple. Mm -hmm. Thomas Lang will tell you it's hard work because Thomas Lang can do anything with his feet that he can do with his hands, and he can do incredible things with his hands. And then he starts mixing those things up. Oh my God, I've got this. <laughs> Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just burping right You're into this human, podcast. Brother. Yeah, we are being human. Um, I'm definitely going kind of low tech tonight. You guys like the uh, going with Pearl Jam look here tonight. Uh, I've seen uh, Thomas Lang go from slow to fast with his feet as he was going from fast to slow with his hands. That's incredible. It's like two helicopters taking off and he does it flawlessly. Double stroke rolls seamlessly executed with his feet. So if somebody wants to hire a guy that can go in and nail a film score soundtrack or do a heavy metal track or do a fusion thing, Thomas Lang is going to get the call. But he also played with the Spice Girls. Boom, whack, boom, whack, boom, whack, you know, which is kind of where I live, you know. Um, so it just comes down to, yeah, how much, how much facility and control do you want to have? And you're going to have to work for it. You can't just talk about it. You have to be in the trenches putting the time in. The nine, the ten hours a day 
day when he started when he was a little boy and he was con and he plays like that on all sorts of instruments I'm bragging on you Thomas and, and then but he's also a kind person he's he looks like a male model he's huge in China he's giant posters of the guy and he was nice enough to ha have me come teach at his camp so we just have this mutual admiration society in the in the drum community where it's like well this guy does this everybody does everything really well but this guy really does that well and this guy does that really well and this girl does this really well and we've become known for something and being known for something some people think it's like the golden handcuffs but it's actually if you can be known for something if you can be known for anything it's a luxury so call me the slamming rock country drummer dude from nashville any day because i'm sitting in a room that i was paid for by being known for that so set your goals have a laser focus and move towards it and sometimes we don't know you know when i was uh, in my teens and 20s i would just was preparing to for any opportunity i wanted to play drums with spira gyra i wanted to wear the colorful shirt and go play smooth jazz i was open into wearing a tuxedo and playing in a symphony orchestra i wanted to be a shoegazer rock band i wanted to teach at a college i wanted to do it all and that that kind of like childlike spirit i still have it today i'm staring at 50 and there's not enough time in the day to do what I want to do you know I want to take over the world I want to keep growing and doing fun things like today have I ever done that co-host a television show no you gotta swim in the deep end of the pool you gotta be fearless two three four five years major Hollywood motion picture yeah. Stranger things have happened. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that brings to another thing, uh, the Styles video that we just released, which is something that I've been saying for years, uh, people need to see that side of you, and uh, a lot of people haven't. Mm. And they certainly have reacted to it. But talk a little bit about that. You are not just, you haven't just touched upon Latin jazz and things of that nature. You play it with pretty good conviction. Mm -hmm. you know, not well, thanks, bud. You know, I mean, you know, any style... <clears throat> that you talk about, I mean, just learning the actual, the physicalities of the groove is step one. But actually listening to that music. So if you really want to know how to play reggae music, then it goes way beyond just learning that your bass drum is on beat three. That's a great start, right? But then immersing yourself in the music and really understanding and do the research and find out what people in Jamaica listen to and where the roots come from and who the who the like the the you know Sly and Robbie go out and download every record those guys ever recorded so getting deep with it and finding out who were who influenced Sly and Robbie so every style is its own masterclass is its own life journey but I still feel like you can get good enough and convincing enough at a lot of styles so if somebody says play a songo I know that I can play a songo with enough variations and throw my limbs around the drums and stuff to play something pretty darn convincingly. Um, I can also play like, encapsulate the feeling of a samba and knowing about partido alto and being able to incorporate percussion in the drum set. And so what I did with uh, Drumming in the Modern World was just kind of like, just kind of wet the whistle and kind of throw out the world like, hey, you've seen me for the last 20 years play with my big backbeat way up here. But what happens if I bring my backbeat down here and I play this little kind of beboppy coat? I, I'm playing in a coat, but I play in like a little bebop drum set and the drums are tuned up a little bit higher and I'm just kind of altering my touch and, and it sounds like boom, whack, boom, whack is, has a completely different slant on it. So kind of almost what the focus has been with drumming in the modern world is anything backbeat oriented. So when I moved to Nashville, that's when I decided, hey, I'm going to really be a specialist because of the opportunities that came to me on playing two and four and everything related to two and four. But if somebody says play a greasy Texas shuffle or play a skiffle or play a traditional uh, Grand Ole Opry two and four country thing or play a train beat, I can do those things. And and uh, tomorrow I'm gonna get up early and I'm gonna do some charting and I'm gonna prepare to go play with this gigantic steel drum orchestra. And we're gonna be playing Calypso and Songo and Soca. And those are three styles that I cover in Drumming in the Modern World. Who is the one person you go to for inspiration if you had to pick one out of, out of, the, out of thin air? Well, you know what's really funny is uh, 
you know, I would think that people would probably be able to see this influence, but I've, I've probably been following a guy named Kenny Aronoff for a long, long time. And the other, the, uh, the other night, it was so sweet because my, our friend Joe Ganzas actually he has a, he has a podcast called Around the Kit. And he called, he, uh, was, I was coming off stage and he's like, Rich, call me in five minutes. We're doing a tribute to Kenny Aronoff and I want you to call in and just tell the listeners how you feel about Kenny. And what I like about Kenny is there's two records that he played on that are called um, Scarecrow and The Lonesome Jubilee. And they came out in the mid to late 80s. And they are Desert Island Records. Because if you listen to the songs that were being recorded, they were totally forbearing the Nashville sound that happened like 10, 15, 20 years later. They were so ahead of their time. But what I like most about Kenny is that he just will give all the credit in the world to, yes, you have to have raw talent, but we're talking about rolling up your sleeves, starting your day at the crack of dawn, setting goals, lifelong persistence, door slammed in your face, picking yourself up, moving forward, work ethic. The guy works. And so if you want anything in life, you have to work for it, it's not gonna land in your lap. And so still to this day, in his 60s, He's working like he's in his 20s, like he's got something to prove. And that's, I never want to be the fat Elvis, ever. Mm -hmm. And so it's really, really good to, uh, to kind of be, find these people and, remind, and, and, and kind of look to them and go, well, well, this guy's doing it. Why can't I do it? You know, so. We're right on, man. Yeah. We should wrap it up. Are we done? Yeah, man. 45 minutes. Okay, so then we, we addressed all the questions? Yeah. Fantastic. Well, we really appreciate everybody tuning in here to Pick Rich's Brain. This is episode three. And thank you for being so loyal to these first three episodes. Of course, this um, webisode exists on YouTube, my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Rich Redmond, R-E-D-M-O-N-D. And of course, on my website, richredmond.com under... Let's see, media, scroll down, podcast. there's a podcast. Yeah. You can download it right to your device and listen at your leisure. Please tell your friends about this if you're digging this, all my concepts on music, motivation, and success. A uh, big hand for my buddy Jim McCarthy there, jimmccarthyvoiceovers.com. And uh, yeah, what else, God? Yeah, we're drumming in the modern world, the sticks. And hey, if you haven't checked this out, this is the Black Sheep Beater uh, from DW Drums. I, I uh, co-designed this product and it's at drum shops and online everywhere. Two sounds in one from one beater. Uh, I'm easy to find. Use hashtag or pick Rich's brain. And we look forward to having you on the next episode. Thank you, everyone. See you soon. <laughs>